panel. <laughs> good morning. Speaking of panels, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the uh, the Sherman Oaks Chamber of Commerce Shift event. Uh, you are here live uh, for the financial panel, and we are really excited to have you with us. Uh, my name is Jonathan Durante with First Republic Bank, and we've got two wonderful panelists with us today. Um, a bit of housekeeping before we start talking about um, what we do and, and how we may be able to add value to you and your businesses. Um, you'll see here on the Accelerance, uh, Excel events panel, um, there is, is a chat function uh, towards the right-hand side there. For any questions that you have for our panelists, we would encourage you to use the chat function exclusively, please. And you can chat those questions in there anytime that you like. Uh, once we segue into the Q&A portion of today, uh, I'll be able to read down the questions that are already in there. So don't be shy. Feel free to chat away. Just know that we won't get to those questions until we actually get to that part of the uh, of the conference, uh, because we want to hear um, all from our panelists first uh, to be able to address any pressing questions that you have for your panel. So uh, let's start off with the introductions. Uh, since I've got the mic, I'll start with me. Uh, my name is Jonathan Durante. Again, as mentioned, I'm with First Republic Bank. I'm the Deputy Regional Managing Director uh, for the Los Angeles region, which covers as far north as Santa Barbara and as far south as San Diego and some parts in the desert as well. Uh, First Republic is one of the top 20 banks in the country, uh, but we keep it very intimate by design. I like to call us the big little bank on the corner. Uh, we deliver a lot of white glove concierge level service to our clients. Bank's been around for 35 years. We're celebrating our 35th anniversary in July, actually. Um, we started off in the 80s as a small mortgage bank, and here we are 35 years later, uh, 100 billion uh, or north of 100 billion in assets. Um, and 150 billion plus in wealth management assets. Um, so uh, we've come a long way and we're really excited to share that with our clients. My day to day is uh, I'm really a problem solver and a financial quarterback for my clients and their complex banking needs. I tend to take point on a lot of lending requests, specifically those related to residential and commercial mortgages, but it's really my job to bring new relationships into the bank and make sure that we deploy our holistic banking experience to get our arms around them. And again, help manage those complex needs that a lot of my clients have. I've uh, been in banking for over 20 years now, grew up in banking at Wells Fargo, um, then was at a smaller regional bank in Beverly Hills, um, and then segue to uh, First Republic Bank uh, for the past four years now. Speaking of Beverly Hills, I'm also the incoming chair, uh, chairman of the Beverly Hills Chamber of Commerce. So I'm a big fan of the Chamber of Commerce world in general. So really honored and privileged um, to be a part of today's event. Speaking of privilege, uh, the bank's motto is, it's a privilege to serve you. And we take that very, very seriously. So again, it's my privilege to be here with you today and certainly my privilege to be with such esteemed colleagues um, on our panel. So speaking of, uh, next up, uh, let's hear from our friend, Sue Ben David, who's going to be focusing on a lot of the legal side today uh, with Lewis Hackett, Sue. Hi, thank you, Jonathan. Thanks for the introduction. I'm Sue Ben David. I'm from, uh, I'm an attorney. I'm with Lewitt Hackman. We're a law firm in Encino. Um, Lewitt Hackman's been around for about over 50 years now. Um, the premier law firm in the San Fernando Valley and well known to a lot of folks, business leaders in the San Fernando Valley. Um, the firm focuses on a variety of business sectors. We have corporate, real estate, franchise, intellectual property, so really, uh, one of our former partners uh, used to say, or he's passed away, uh, used to say that his biggest asset were his feet because if he needed something, all he all he needed to do was to walk down the hall to the next uh, lawyer and help and get some get some questions answered. Personally, for me, I am chair of the employment practice group of the firm. Um, we only represent companies, only the management side of employment claims point matters. So. My typical day is picking up the phone or now Zoom or some other platform where I can see the client um, and answering questions every day about this, the employee walked into my room sort of now what? Now what do we do? And uh, walked into my office and try to help them walk the landmine of the various, uh, uh, sort of avoid the landmines of the various employment law matters that can arise. So a lot of the, on the consulting side, um, so leaves of absence, wage and hour compliance, uh, writing contracts, separation agreements, things of that nature. Really the whole picture of employment from the time that you post that advertisement until the time that they've separated from employment and everything in between. For management, managing their performance, setting up their expectations. So sometimes we're helping employers write those dreaded uh, 
you know, termination memos or disciplinary forms, things of that nature. Also um, do a, a large amount of litigation. I would say right now we're doing, today with COVID, it's probably more consulting, but I would say it really it's 50% of my practice is litigation, anything from class action litigation, individual lawsuits, um, from harassment, discrimination, wage and hour. I'll talk about some wage and hour issues on, when we're on the panel. Um, but uh, really, it's, there's so many laws. It's so difficult to be an employer today um, because you really need to you know, make sure that you're educated and know what's going on. So that's my job is to help people sort of understand what the laws are, how to comply, weigh those risks, and take, make, make informed decisions with their employees. Um, I've been practicing for about 30 years. Um, I'm starting my 31st year. I can't believe that. Um, I started off in the big, you know, international firm downtown, and then uh, transitioned to the Be in the Valley. I was uh, president of the bar association, the local bar association, several years ago. As are many of some of my partners have been presidents of the bar. And um, looking forward to being on the panel. Thank you for for having me uh, for the chamber. I've done some, some also some webinars, as I told Jonathan before. We did some webinars for some cham for chambers and different organizations in this unique environment that we're in, and uh, look forward to answering your questions. Great, thank you, Sue, so much. And next up, we've got Nicole Kukluk Waldman uh, with Collaborate LA, who's got some really interesting insights on the governmental side of things. Yeah, uh, and I think a background on the legal front as well. So, uh, Nicole, the floor is yours. Tell us about uh, tell us about Collaborate. Thank you. So my name is Nicole kuklock Waldman. I'm actually a lawyer like Sue, and I practiced at Big Law for a long time as well uh, prior to founding Collaborate. So Collaborate is a um, government affairs firm with community outreach component. So what we do is we do lobbying and advocacy on different issue areas and problem solving in the city of Los Angeles mainly. We also deal with the other cities in Los Angeles County primarily, but um, the city of LA keeps us pretty busy. And uh, what we do is we uh, work with clients who are dealing with law changes, as Sue can say, uh, that that's a, that is a challenge with employers in the city of LA for sure. Um, so we do a lot of that with specific concerns or then specific problem solving. I'm also a land use attorney. So we do entitlement work for, um, so for example, let's say you want to build a project or you want to get a clearance for a, you know, a signage district or something like that. That's also work we do. And we've been doing that. Me and my partner have been doing that for about 20 years now. And um, I, one of the challenges as Sue is talking about is the changing landscape and that's what we deal a lot with is the changing regulatory landscape which is always changing um my husband runs the valley industry and commerce association and it's been no joke how many things have come down for employers in the city of los angeles specifically in the last probably 60 days or 90 days uh so you can attest to that um and how we handle those things and how we deal with those things and make sure we're in compliance so we've been doing that now for about uh for like i said we've been doing it for about 20 years i also teach these subjects at usc i'm a professor there and and um, I'm really excited to be here today. I've been doing a lot of presentations on PPP lately. So this is a little different. So I'm excited to be here and happy to answer any questions you'll have. Fantastic. Well, the, you and I can double team the PPP questions because you know the, uh, you're, you're the consultant that we would go to for advice to dispense to the clients. And, you know, we do all the fun paperwork pushing when it comes to getting it in front of the SBA. So thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> we've got a, you know, we've got, it sounds like we've got the legal and education fronts covered, which is wonderful. I'll try to chime in where possible on the, uh, you know, you know the banking and the lending and, and investment landscape where it makes sense um so let's let's jump into it uh, because we've got some questions for the group as a whole and then again we can segue into um uh, whatever questions come up from uh from the folks that are watching us today so let's let's start off with sue i'm going to ask you this first and then uh nicole please you know um you know please add to you know how, how collaborate views this but um the first question is what steps can employers and small business owners take to mitigate the risk of exposure? And by the way, that's a bit of a loaded question um, because I think exposure, we're kind of talking about, you know, business liability exposure, but you, you may want to opine on, you know, exposure to the actual virus itself since, you know, that's a big player in this whole environment. So what, um, you know, whatever exposure means to you in this case. So Sue. Thank you. Yeah. So exposure, when I think of exposure, of course, I'm being a lawyer, I usually think about liability exposure. Um, because, uh, you know, if you're being sued, that's going to be your primary focus. And how do I get out of this lawsuit? So how does, how does an employer mitigate the risks of exposure really is, number one, staying informed. 
make sure that you have someone tasked with the responsibility to go find out what those rules are. So that's number one, staying informed, and then having someone with boots on the ground to make sure that they now implement those rules and, and your day-to-day -day policies and procedures. So, um, and, and if we're focusing specific to now as to COVID-19, I really think that it, it's important for employers to go check what the what are the orders because they're changing all the time. I mean, as we hear in the news just today, um, now beaches are going to be closed because of COVID-19 and there's maybe changes, there's changes in restaurants and dining restaurants that happened the other day. So really go and take a look at the applicable orders that apply to you. So if we are in the San Fernando Valley, I'll give you an example. Um, the state of the county of Los Angeles uh, issues a its, its, its orders um, that are on its website. And I literally make a practice of every day, every morning, I know it seems a little OCD maybe, but I have a practice of going on to the county's website, taking a look at the order. And they, they actually do a good job of highlighting whatever's changed. And so you'll see the date and whatever's changed. Take a look at the orders and see how has this impacted your business? Because it's an order. This is a county order that you have to comply with. And I think the, the mayor was on the other day and saying, this is not a, a checklist of, of things that you want to do. These are orders that you have to comply with. And the county and the city both are taking it very seriously and coming in and finding employers, companies. They are citing companies. They are um, telling the DWP, the city's telling the DWP to turn off water if you're not compliant. So for right now, the focus on compliance with the COVID-19 orders, go get informed. Check, take a look at the county, um, county order, the city order, and the protocols that 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 are you're, that you're required to comply with. So, example, one of the protocols. This is for the essential businesses appendix A, but there's a whole list of them. Go take a look and make sure that you have it in place, and make sure that you comply. And and, and then there's a lot more about liability exposure, but really, I think that's the, the first and foremost is finding out what the rules are, and then putting your HR folks, people on the ground, your operations people to go through those and make sure that you're in compliance. Great, thank you, Sue. Um, so Nicole, same question for you. How can uh, employers and small business owners mitigate their risk of exposure, however exposure means to you? Yeah, I, I mean, obviously it is a crazy regulatory environment. I mean, the best advice I give clients is do the work on the front end so you're not trying to fix things on the back end. And sometimes that means spending money on the front end. If you are small, it might mean hiring a consultant or reaching out to your lawyer and getting a quick consult. But that is that money is so well spent on the front end. I cannot tell you how much time and money I spend for clients trying to fix things that I could have done so much easily and cheaper on the front end. And I know that's hard because, you know, things are tight and you're trying to be thoughtful and careful and you don't want to waste money. But if you have a good team behind you, if you have good consultants, if you have good support, they're not going to ring you around and you know make up stuff you need. They're just going to say, here's what you need. And that's what I have as a business owner. I have a team. I have different lawyers and consultants I use for different things that I trust, that they're not going to waste my time. And I know it's worth spending that money on the front end to cover up stuff you know, and make sure my eyes are dotted and T's are crossed on the front end, so nothing loops back on the back end. Fixing this stuff is expensive, not only because you can have to pay fines and other things, but you got to pay lawyers and other people to fix it. You know, it's like, it's, you know, in my land use work, you know, I tell people, you know, so you've been unjustly treated and that's terrible. Guess how you're going to resolve that? You're going to be in court and have to pay for that, you know? And that's the reality. You really want to look at, you know, what can you get on the front end? And with it, with this compliance, whether it's consulting your lawyer, consulting an HR expert, consulting your HR team, making sure your I's are dotted and T's are crossed, that is the best insurance you can have to move forward. I'm very lawyer when it comes here. I, you know, I joke with people, you know, I know what happens when clients listen to me and when they don't. And I tell them sometimes, just listen to me now, you know, pay me now, pay me later. It doesn't matter to me. But it costs more on the back end. It's more uncomfortable and painful on the back end. And when you have that information on the front end, you can so much more effectively and efficiently handle situations that are coming up. And, and Justin, so, can I add something to that? Because you, you asked sure. about COVID-19 as the exposure to virus. Because there's obviously, Nicole and I are, we're not the doctors, you know, we're the lawyers. But how do, the other issue is how do you mitigate the risk of exposure to the virus itself, right? And I, I do think, again, it's getting informed the county has done a good job of, as, as the CDC, of telling, and there's there's documents on the website of saying how, what do you do if an employee comes forward and they say their spouse has COVID-19, they have COVID-19, they're caring for somebody who has COVID-19, now what? Right. Now what? These are the questions that I'm getting right now. Yep. 
you know, I, today I just got three emails from people saying somebody doesn't want to come to work because they have to take care of somebody who's got COVID-19 or the spouse does. Now what do we do? So even though we're not clearly doctors, we're not giving any medical advice, we can point them to the direction of what do they do now in their, you know, put, sending them home, putting them on leave, and then and advising when can they come back. And again, I'm going to, I have documents on my desk, but, uh, you know, different uh, documents from the county which talk about release from isolation and when can they come back and, and what you should do. So go again, go look up the sources, make sure you follow that to try to, again, mitigate the exposure to the virus itself for the, for the owners of the businesses or their employees. Yeah, that's a good point. You know, obviously there are a lot of tools out there. Sometimes it's just figuring out where to go to get them. Um, so, you know, when I think about exposure, obviously I'm thinking about exposure to wealth or business revenue loss, you know, looking at the, the actual dollars and cents of it. And I, I think the through line through everything and, you know, Nicole, you know, really put a, uh, a fine point on this. You, you shouldn't be going and trying to navigate the landscape alone, right? Uh, hopefully, you know, you've built uh, a network of trusted advisors and professionals as you've built your business. And I would say now more than ever is the time to leverage them. So, you know, we're talking to folks and asking them, look, do you have a strong banking partner? Certainly these are potential prospects coming to the bank and we're, we're getting a lot of them for better or worse because just the lack of responsiveness from some, uh, from some others in the landscape, right? Um, you know, we're very, we're very proactive in terms of engaging. So that's helped us actually win some business uh, because, you know, we're there. We want to be very present for our, for our clients, especially now, whether it's Zoom or otherwise, right? Um, then, you know, do, do you have a good CPA to mitigate things like, you know, if you've got a PPP loan going, I'm sure Nicole can speak to this later, um, you know, or do you have a good attorney that understands that landscape well? Um, do you have a good attorney that understands the employment issues that you might have in, in Sue's world, right? So uh, leaning on those trusted advisors is more important than ever. Uh, we've talked a lot about estate plans, right? Obviously, there is a mortality aspect to everything that's happening. So if it's been a while since someone's revisited their trust or their living will, um, or they're just their estate plan in general, business succession plans, if you, God forbid, become too ill to maintain the business, right? Or as things get back on their feet, you know, by the time this, the smoke clears or there's, you know, some established degree of normalcy, um, who's going to be running the business at that point, right? Um, are there potential insurance needs now? That whole landscape is changing drastically. So these are all the conversations that we're having with clients right now. And it really, the through line through everything is rely on your trusted advisors, engage them early, engage them often, don't try to navigate it alone. Um, if there was ever a more, you know, justifiable reason for our existence, it's now. So um, it's it's take advantage of them. Take advantage of the network that you have. And if you don't have one, now is a great time to leverage organizations like your local chamber of commerce. Um, Sherman Oaks is a great area. A lot of wonderful professionals. Um, you know, Susan Encino, Nicole's local. I'm sure she's got a big footprint. You know, our bank. We've got a branch in Studio City and a branch in Encino. So we've got you covered on both ends of the boulevard. So uh, take advantage of your chamber. If you don't know where to start, start there. So that's great. Thank you. Um, now we've talked about mitigating exposure. Uh, let's talk about deliverables to our clients, right? So um, Nicole, we'll start with you on this one. How will customer service change? And what are some of the opportunities that you see coming out of this? Because every crisis has opportunities. So that's true. What, what have you seen? Um, you know, I'm just seeing a lot of transition to more flexible ways of doing business, whether it's, you know, in my work, there's a lot of texting that goes on and a lot of emails, so that doesn't change. Um, and now we're doing a lot of Zoom meetings, which, you know, as everybody's probably a little Zoomed out right now, um, we're seeing a lot of that. I mean, the, the biggest challenge in my business is the one-on-one -on -one interaction that we have a lot of, you know, getting in front of people, getting around people. And so what we're trying to do is figure out how to do that differently. One of the ways we've been doing that in my business is we've been attending a lot of um, the panel or big meetings we would normally attend on Zoom. And then we'll use the chat feature to check in with people or we'll text while we, oh, hey, I see you. How's it going? Oh, what's going on with you? How's it happening? Um, we've been trying that. I've also been trying to, you know, try to engage people on, um, you know, and make sure just check in on people, you know, use the opportunity to check in on people who may be like, are single and haven't seen a human, another human for four months, you know, and use that opportunity to be like, hey, I'm thinking about you or my screen 
screaming children are down the hall, um, you know, and using it as an opportunity to just, again, connect with people on, you know, because that's what we look for in these relationship builds, right, is the connection. And so it's just trying to find a different way to connect. And maybe it's like, oh, my gosh, it's been so long since we've been out. I miss that restaurant. And, you know, how are you doing? Or I miss visiting your cat, you know, and it just it's about it's about connecting with others and, you know, seeing what you can do to help them make sure they're OK. Hey, is there anything I can do to help the situation? I don't know that there's much, but who knows? You know, you don't know what you can give. And it's about, you know, just, you know, and part of it is just, it's avoiding the resistance. Right. If you're resisting it's not going to work. You have got to embrace what's happening. The world is never going to be the same. It's just never going to be the same. I promise you some meetings you always had in person will not always be in Zoom. Now, do I think that we're all going to be wearing masks for the next 30 years? I, I hope not. But I do think that some things we're learning from this in the different business spheres is never going to be the same. I mean, for example, I teach at USC. I am, um, they moved uh, my classes on off campus to online last semester. This semester, everything is online. Next semester, they're doing a transition, but my, all my classes are online. So I've had to go back, recreate material, you know, and, but you have to be open to that change because it's happening whether you like it or not. And I don't see it as a bad thing. I'm creating this material. I may use it five or six years from now. That's great. You know, hey, I have the time to do it. <laughs> you know, so this is, you know, I'm trying to kind of see it as an opportunity to build and grow and see where the market is taking me and see where my relationships are going and just, you know, kind of work with that flow because resisting it is just, is just pointless energy spent on nothing. And I mean, we all know everything is in a constant state of change. And I, I think, you know, I was trying to think back from my students the last time I had experienced something traumatic like this. And for me, it was 9-11. I was in DC on 9-11 and the world changed that day for me. As a, I was 23 years old, I was at Georgetown University Law Center. We thought that DC was getting bombed. And the reason I tell you that is, you know, everybody has several of those moments in the context of their lives and this is just one of ours. And how did the world change after 9-11? Our experience at airports changed, our experiences in security changed, you know, but there was lots of opportunity there, but, you know, to sit around and be like, oh, I wish it was the olden days doesn't suit anybody. So the best thing I can tell you is, you know, try to use what opportunities you have to try to move forward, which isn't always easy, but, you know, you really have to kind of lean into what is happening and just be like, okay, how are things gonna change and how can I adjust to that change? For example, I bought my screen here for all my Zoom calls. It's been very handy. See, there you go. It's all shifting on the fly, right? And pivoting. But I love that. <laughs> I love that. The idea about embracing change, um, you know, and resist the resistance. Um, that's that's great. Yeah, because look, if, any, if anything, you've got, you've got to be flexible. And as a business owner, you know, now more than ever, um, you got to shift to the, you know, the businesses that that emerge the strongest from situations like these are the ones that were able to pivot um, and, you know, think toward the future. So that's great. Thank you, Nicole. So what about you? How is customer service changing for you and where do you see opportunities? Yeah, I thought that was interesting, Nicole. I was listening to you and I agree. You have to be creative and just, you know, for lack of a better phrase, go with the flow because it, it, it's here to stay for the long haul. I think like, I think your example of being in the airport, our experience has changed now in the airport. We can't, we used to be able to, at least when I was a child, go right up to the gate to collect somebody who was coming off. And that, you know, that's not happening anymore. So here, you know, when, when COVID-19 hit and um, I had to very quickly learn the rules, right? I had to, and any uh, lawyers like me, we had to quickly learn the rules and, and then start, you know, giving advice because that's what our clients needed. So you have to, like, if you're a teacher, you have to learn to be able to teach your client, to your employees. And as a lawyer, you have to learn the rules to be able to teach them to your, to your clients. So being, figuring it out, being creative, and then it's how do you communicate that? So, you know, I doing, you know, lots of webinars, lots of emailing and, and just trying to increase the communication because it's not face to face like it was once. There's no breakfast meetings. There's no lunch meetings. You know, we're all we're doing the Zoom meetings. And I agree, I'm pretty Zoomed out, but that's our new reality, right? Even this very networking session that we're doing now is, is you know, now, this panel is is indicative of that how we have to be creative to do something like this um but on the on the one hand i try i'm always the i'm the type of person where the glass is always half full that's just who i am by nature and i, I did notice one positive thing um you know normally when a client has a question they'll call me on the phone and we'll talk about it on the phone but but more recently i've had zoom calls or team calls where i'm actually seeing the client face to face talking with them, collaborating with them. And of course, we're all wearing, you know, t-shirts and shorts, 
Um, but you know, we're not looking what the, like I'm talking to CEOs and I'm seeing their, their bedrooms, you know, it's, it's interesting or the CFOs of companies, but that, you know, really does bring a little bit more to the relationship because you really don't now you, there's there, I have many clients I've never seen in person because, you know, I'm, you know, they, they call me from other States from, you know, all over the place. Um, and uh, so now I get to actually see them in person and have a dialogue. So I think that's an interesting development that a positive out of all of this is that I'm actually seeing more people being more impactful because you can always, you can do more when it's electronic. We can reach more people when, when you have a larger platform like this. So I think that's, that's um, you know, a, a positive. And, and that's, you know, it's, it's you, you hit some really great points there, Sue. It's been my exact same experience, right? So you know, for us, the customer service obviously has changed. I think we've all, you know, we've all addressed that point in terms of how we're engaging the clients, right? For better or for worse, it's these digital platforms now. Um, and yes, Zoom fatigue is a real thing. Zoom fatigue, WebEx fatigue. Uh, but like you said, Sue, it's, it just is what it is, right? It's, I mean, that's, that's at least in the short term or the medium term, I guess it looks more likely. Um, this is the way that we're going to be able to interact with each other. But I will say the happy accent, it's same experience, right? I'm seeing clients that I've never seen before or, you know, C-suite executives um, broadcasting live from their home because, you know, they don't have the benefit of a face-to-face -face meeting or, uh, or engaging the way that they would traditionally. So we kind of just skip right to the punch and uh, have, a, have a, a more intimate or as intimate as this can be uh, on Zoom or WebEx uh, interaction from the get-go which there's a real value add there, right? Um, other customer service opportunities that we're seeing is, again, just being present, right? Your point about communication was great. I think now more than ever, it's important to over-communicate. Just human condition in a situation like this, in a crisis like this, it's a, it's easy to kind of retreat into your own shell. Um, and, you know, we're, we're doing anything but that, right? We're letting clients know we're not going inwards, we're going outwards. We're here for you now more than ever. Like I said, you know, as, as a as a byproduct of that, we're we're winning a lot of business to the bank because folks aren't getting that experience from their other institutions, right, or their other trusted advisors. So, you know, I would say the more that you, the more present that you are, um, really really opens up a world of opportunities for your business, right. And going to Nicole's point, you've got to be creative of how how you deploy that content, right. So we've always been a pretty um, event friendly bank. We put on some interesting events, both educational and fun. Um, the fun ones you know, the variations in a theme, right? Um, but we are we are deploying a lot of virtual events uh, with relevant information for our clients. Um, and those are free to attend. You know, you just have to be a client to the bank. Uh, and in some cases we kind of open it up to everybody. So, you know, getting it out there, being present, um, giving your clients point of access is really important for our, we've, uh, we've really kind of doubled down on our digital platform. So our online banking suite, uh, you know, we love the tech. But one thing that we always say is that behind all the tech, there's always a human being. But at the same time, since tech is kind of what we're limited to right now, you know, we're really enhancing some of the basic features of our online banking portal and making things even easier. So, you know, if you as a business owner have those tools, think about, you know, how can we maybe um, open that up even further, right? Uh, to touch more clients or to make things easier for clients. So customer service, again, to Nicole's point, that's change and it's going to change for <coughs> there will be lasting effects of this just like we saw from 9-11 right there you know the, this is just uh something that will linger on for a long time and we see look it's upsetting the apple cart in so many ways right the idea of this traditional um gathering around a city center hub well that might be out the window now because because of this as long as you've got a stable internet connection you could engage and deploy content from the four corners of the world you don't need to be in the city we're already seeing migration trends out of the city for folks that were, uh, you know, too nervous about what's going on justifiably, you know, they're looking to get away from heavy population centers. So that whole landscape is changing and you have to ask yourself as a business owner, okay, well, if populations are shifting or how people are engaging with business is shifting, you know, what do I need to do to keep relevant um, and to keep flexible with that? So these are all wonderful points and, you know, it's good to see that in our various industries, we're, we're having similar experiences. So thank you both for that. So next, um, I get that's actually a good segue to this uh, next question, um, which is you know kind of a, a subset I think of what we're talking about. So business relationships, um, I mean, will they become more hybrid? I think we've kind of asked, answered that. And you know, how will they become more hybrid? And, and which which particular business relationships, right? Because I don't think it's always going to be strictly digital. But which you know, in your respective in industries, 
you know, where do you see um, these hybrid relationships or how do you see them taking form? Is it going to be with sub, some segmentations versus others? So Sue, why don't you tackle this one first and then we'll segue to Nicole. Sure. Um, it, it is difficult in the litigation context hmm. um, because much of litigation is obviously in person, going to court, doing depositions, going to trial, having hearings in court. Um, and we are trying to figure that out right now. I've had several mediations where we've been, they've been electronic. So similar to this, we're in one room and then the mediator, you know, pops in and tells us what, where the other side is at. And then he leaves or she leaves and then goes into some other room, a virtual, a virtual room. It's not, it, it actually worked. It's not ideal, but it, it does actually work. Um, and similar with depositions, um, having to do depositions, we're still, we're working on that, figuring things out, um, doing them all electronically via some platform like a Zoom platform. So I think that that is going to be the future for litigation for a while. I actually had a court of appeal hearing last week, and it was a video conference. So I saw the three judges in front of me uh, electronically. And I, I had I was in I actually was in my office, so I'm mostly at home. I was afraid my dog would bark, so I went into the office. <laughs> Mine barking in the but, background now. I, I, I can empathize, yes. Yeah, so I didn't want that happening with, my, with the court of with the bench, you know, three judges, justices in front of me. Um, so, it, it, you know, and it was new for them. I think that was their first day of video conference. So it, it's it's here. I don't know what's going to happen with jury trials. They're going to have to figure that out. And I think they're working through that now. There's some proposals that are pending, but it's going to be, yeah, yeah difficult. But, but we'll figure it out. I, you know, that you bring, you touch on a really interesting point there. I didn't even think about, yeah, how's that going to happen within person litigation? So, you know, how, how you know, what, how the courthouse is going to operate, right? Are they just, are they ultimately just going to be a center for storing and housing, you know, paperwork and data? Or will there be, you know, in-person trials happening at some point? It'll be really interesting to see how that landscape changes. So thank you. Uh, Nicole, what about you? Yeah, you know, um, I will say, you know, like I said, the text is really popular in my work, which was very foreign to me when I came from law into lobbying. Everybody texts each other, which is very mm -hmm. odd to me. But, um, you know, the one challenge we have had in uh, my work is the Public Records Act, all the documents that go to and from a government agency are publicly available. And well, it, uh, so what happens is it really, um, the reason I bring that up is it's not about hiding something, it's really about making more work for the city officials who literally have to respond to these requests all the time. So they are very resistant to email and anything that creates a paper trail that they have to go dig up later and spend their Friday or Saturday digging up. So we've been trying to figure out, you know, you know, just getting people, catching people on the phone, which isn't always easy. And that's kind of been the challenge with the city folks is like catching people, you know, where I used to catch people at events where I could stop by the office and say, hey, how's it going? You're working on my case? I can't do that right now. So that has been the biggest challenge is, you know, working around the existing California law to make sure I'm complying with the law and not making more work for somebody by putting something in writing that they're later going to be like, oh God, now I have to go, you know, find all those emails. So that's been a little bit of a challenge. But um, like I said, it's, you know, again, it's about changing and finding the opportunity and you know like sue was talking about the courts going online which i think is so cool where you would be able to do an appearance without having to go downtown that can save clients a lot of money you know when it takes when i have to do a hearing and it takes me four or five hours to get downtown park wait for my item get back i have to charge that back to a client when you can do that online i mean that's a win for everybody not only can sue get back to work faster but um you know the client pays less which is cool it's a waste of time i, I mean i get it she's using her time and they've got to pay for it but it enables her to be you know give better customer service and so i'm trying to look for those opportunities where i'm like okay well this could be better and i can tighten things up and i can make things easier for clients and you know one of the challenges I'm having right now is I do a lot of community outreach, which I usually do traditionally door to door. I can't do that right now. So I'm trying to figure out how to turn that into mail and digital without over tech. There's always, you know, a sell to over tech things and I don't want to over tech them. I want to use technology as a, um, I don't want the new shiny thing. I want to be able to use technology to make my life easier and better and make my clients get better results, but I'm not interested in teching things for the sake of teching them, which I think sometimes innovation happens like, oh, look, you can do this all on your phone. It's like, yeah, but I don't want to do it on my phone, <laughs> you know? So, um, and trying to kind of, you know, sit and thoughtfully think about how are you going to get the results you're looking for in different ways, you know, whether Sue is like, okay, I'm going to go to the office because I don't want the dogs to bark, but I'm going to see the judges and do my, my hearing to, um, you know, me where, okay, I would normally go knock door to door. I can't do that. So how am I going to pull those addresses? How am I going to get these people's attention when I can't knock? on their door 
and get that information to them. So, you know, again, it's about just thinking through problems and really just taking some time and sitting back and be like, okay, here's where I need to end up. Here's where I, how I usually go. How am I going to go about it a different way? Yeah. Kind of taking it line item by line item to see, you know, how are we going to address, you know, how we did this traditionally. Yeah. Because again, you know, what's hybrid, right? If, if there's no, if, if, you're, if you're really unable to interact with someone physically or it's, it's ill-advised to do that until, you know, hopefully maybe there's, uh, you know, a vaccine or some mitigant um, that makes the in-person stuff a, a little bit safer. Uh, yeah. You know, you have to, you have to completely pivot from what you've been doing before. You know, it's when it's, I think part of it, Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to no, no, go, go ahead, please. I was gonna say, I think part of it too is being thoughtful about people's limits. Like, mm -hmm. I feel like, you know, one of the challenges when everything started opening up was I had a lot of friends whose employers were like, okay, come back to the office now. And they were like, whoa, 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 <laughs> like, you know, and I think, you know, understanding that, you know, just because you might be comfortable with that doesn't mean other people are. And, you know, trying to be thoughtful, I think that's part of that relationship built in this opportunity, you know, it's like, oh, you know what? you can work from home right now. We'll figure that out. You've got kids, you've got the dog, you know, it's not safe. You're immunocompromised, your sister's immune, whatever that is. Right. And I think that's part of it too. I'm sorry. I didn't need to interrupt you. No, no, no. That's okay. It's great. That's it's a, it's a great additional color. I mean, for us, it's interesting being um, uh, essential workers. Uh, we, we've had, uh, it, it's been a bit of balancing act. So we've been kind of hybrid from the get go, right? In my role, which is primarily business development and client engagement, um, the, the work from home environment wasn't too far to begin with. I mean, there were days where I would just work from home anyway. It's just different when you have to, when you have no choice, right? <laughs> or when it's like that every day. So that was, again, that was culturally, that wasn't a big shift, right? It was just a lot more of something that we were doing on a limited basis just all the time. But we've still got our branches open, right? Like the Studio City and Encino branches, we've still got personnel there for in-person transactions because we have to be open. So, you know, we're still seeing the public um, we've taken, you know, we've taken great precautions in terms of limiting the amount of people that can come into the branch at any given time. You know, you'll probably see this at some of the larger banks too, where sometimes there are lines around the corner because depending on the real estate they have inside, they have to be very careful about how many people that can come in because it's not necessarily a quick transaction. You could be in there five, 15, 20 minutes, um, to transact on your business needs. Right. So, you know, the, the, the hybridity, if that's a word, I don't think it is, but, um, you know, the hybrid nature uh, of customer interaction has kind of been part of our DNA from the get-go with this. Um, same thing when it comes to, you know, something specifically that focuses on my world, you know, lending transactions. The big question was, how do we mitigate, you know, these are documents that have to be signed in the presence of a notary, uh, and then they have to be sent to the county for recording. Um, you know, you can't docu-sign that sort of stuff, uh, or at least that's not, uh, that's not in the cards right now. So, you know, ways that we've tried to address that is any documents that don't need the notarial presence, we send separately in an electronic packet. And then the notary just shows up. It, it severely reduces the amount of time that the notaries are spending with the clients, with the borrowers. Um, to, it limits it to maybe 10 minutes where, you know, a loan signing, depending on how thick the documentation package is, could take up to an hour, especially if there are questions. So now we send a majority of it uh, electronically. So if the clients have questions at that point, they can call me and reach out to me. Uh, and then, you know, it just leaves a few documents for the notary to sign. So these are kind of the steps that we've taken to, um, you know, to maintain the engagement. But, you know, there's the hybrid nature of it right right then and there, right? There's, you know, we, we still, as much as we can and as much as everybody's comfortable with it, you know, we want to maintain that human front. And in some cases, like Sue was saying, you have to, right? Again, how's, how's the jury trial going to go now? Will it be all virtual? Maybe, maybe. Um, but is that the ideal way of doing it? No, you know, and, and certainly a lot of this isn't ideal, um, but it's, it goes back to your point, Nicole, about having to be flexible um, and figuring out, you know, how, how to pivot in this environment. So that was great. Thank you. Um, so moving along, um, what, uh, and I think this will be interesting for all of us with our respective professions. So what structural or operational challenges did your specific industry encounter during COVID-19? Um, and then how did you, or either you individually or, or your firm, if you can speak to that, um, how did you address them? So Stu, why don't you start off with this one? Yeah, so the, the big joke from our managing shareholders that now we have 70 offices um, because we have 70 people working from home, mm -hmm. um, whether that's the lawyers, or the assistants, the paralegals, the, the office personnel, the accounting, everybody's working at home. And that does have challenges because some people are definitely more productive than others. Um, and, you know, you, there has to be a lot of trust 
but sometimes there's a lack of trust and sometimes people do take advantage. And I know that a lot of professional services firms are having the same experiences where people are at home and they're supposed to be working, but they're, they're not. And stuff isn't, in that, and, and people will admit, a lot of people say, I'm just not as productive at home. For me, I'm actually more productive at home because I have less people coming into my office to interrupt me. So I actually get more work done at home. But for others, it, it is a challenge. Um, and and just yeah, productivity is hard, but um, we've all, we all have our setups now. We have computers. I bought a printer, I bought a scanner, and I bought a monitor so that I don't have to work from my laptop the whole time. And it's it's been working for me. I'm actually very happy just not having to wear a suit every day to go to the office and, and just working from home. But it does, it does impact some staff members' productivity, and that's um, that can be a little frustrating for for me personally and for others in the firm I know. So we've taken steps to try to adjust that. We had just give you an example. We had um, I actually gave this advice to a client. They had somebody who wasn't productive, so they said they gave him a log to say, "I want to see what you're doing all day. Like, how are you doing? Because you know, we're paying you to sit at your computer at home and work. And what are you doing?" And he actually had to write from 10 to 11, this is what I was working on. And then he realized, oh, I'm not as productive as I otherwise could be. So then it was to help him, um, give him those skills to be a little bit more focused, a little more productive. But it is hard. Like you were saying, Nicole, kids at home and dogs and interruptions, things happen. I mean, my kids are, I do sometimes, my kids do sometimes knock on the door and come in, but they're grown. They can, you know, take care of themselves. Um, so they don't always agree with that. They want me to make their lunch. Um, but yeah, so we have to be patient but at the same time, try to increase productivity. That's the challenge. Maybe we lost Jonathan. Yeah, I think we lost Jonathan, but I would just, I would agree with you. I think that the challenge, you know, is just making, you know, and I think we've all kind of got a rhythm now, right? I got my monitor too and my desk and I got a mouse and a keyboard and I got a printer with a scanner and the same thing. So I've got the whole setup here and thinking about how that works, you know, and, you know, kind of getting in your rhythm and figuring out how you, you know, what works for you. Cause I mean, I had, you know, I work generally on the road anyway, so I kind of had a system, so I modified it slightly, but I, I you know, and it's about, I think getting your system and then making sure your employees are on their system, how you're going to manage that. And that's hard. Like you said, with the log that can help when you're tr maybe tracking hours, you know, where you have data entry, time entry, like, Hey, enter your time, which, you know, a lot of lawyers do and you can do for anything really, right. Is making sure people are, you know, getting in there. They should, there aren't a lot of excuses now. Like there are excuses, stuff happens there, you know, you know, the dog threw up, whatever. But um, in the meantime, the reality is, is you should be able to get a, a work day done at this point, like not the perfect work day, but a functional work day. And for some people, it is a more effective work day. For me, it's far more effective than being in an office because schlepping to the office takes so much time that I could just do calls when I was in the car. And now it's like, I can, you know, sit down and start working right away. I don't have an hour of prep time. And, you know, and I have found that that's um, really functional. I think the biggest challenge goes to Sue a little bit is, is the compliance and just making sure you're in compliance. There are lots of labor laws and then lots of other laws right now um, and just making sure you're in compliance with all of them because that stuff can come bite you as you know so yeah is Jonathan I don't know if did, are you there are we uh, can you hear me okay great so at least, for whatever reason my computer decided to do an update to the webcam in the middle of this oh, no. but I'm, I'm still here and I'm listening so please hopefully I'll try to refresh the browser and see if I can get back um, please continue on I just wanted to let you know that I am still here in some way shape or form <laughs> okay. I can actually go to that call address what you were talking about with the clients because that's where um, I've been having a, answering a lot of questions about how do we stay in compliance during this time period and what are we supposed to do? What are employers supposed to do? So um, in terms of people working from home, you have to make sure that you, there's some back, hi Jonathan, have to make sure that you're paying for all of their uh, business expenses that they incur. So if people are using their phones or their computers there has to be some discussion about what, what is a what is the cost of that, and are you reimbursing the employee for the personal use uh, of their of their of their cars or their internet expense or their phones? There's actually an, an act that a bill that's pending. You may know this. Well, there's a bill that's pending, the Telecommuting Act. It's going it to hasn't it's still in early stages, but that's talking about reimbursement of expenses for employees who are telecommuting. So we'll see what that looks like. Um, and of course, when people are at home. They're not going to work, you know, nine to 12, take their lunch, come back and leave at five. They're going to take a break, go off for half an hour, come back, go off for half an hour. So 
what do we do with that? There's there's meal break rules that people have to take their timely meal breaks for you know the non-exempt employees. There's rest break rules. There's record keeping. Employers have to keep track of hours. You got to pay overtime. There's there's so many wage and hour rules that that are that apply. Regard at least today till bills are passed today the, the employer you still have an obligation to to fix to make sure that you're in compliance with that. And that's where I'm seeing a lot of problems uh, is that is the exposure on, on the wage and hour. Um, and there are plaintiff attorneys out there who are just waiting for the liability exposure to, to be large enough to make it worth their while to sue. So like you said, Nicole, pay a little bit up front, get, get in compliance, better to do it up front than after the fact. It's much cheaper to fix it in advance than it is to rectify it after the fact. So. Yeah. That's a really great point, too, especially about the wage and hours. I'm glad you brought that up because, again, I, you know, I have some direct reports in my world. Um, and, yeah, that's the big question, right? You know, if they're working from home, are they religiously in front of the computer for that time? You know, when is the meal break? When can they take it? You know, are we still adhering to those strict guidelines? And, I, I, you know, the, the marching orders for now are yes, but yeah, how will that change, right? Um, I, I will say, you know, the overall challenge for my industry was uh, – the Salesforce again had this kind of virtual aspect to what we do anyway. You know, we're very on the move. We can work from home if we have to. We're on our phones. We're in the cars. So it's not like you know the office present was that uh, essential to begin with. But all of our support staff, right? The people that you know process accounts in the back end, the paperwork, um, you know, loan processing, loan servicing. You know, that's that's a vast amount of people. Are and, and and we're not even you know we don't even have the biggest employee base, but we have about forty five hundred people nationwide. Uh, a good chunk of them or operational. So in a very short period of time, we had to figure out a way to get all those from home, all those that could be at home at home. And, you know, how do we mitigate the risks for those that still needed to have an office presence? So that was a big challenge right there. And you have to figure, you know, with the larger banks, um, multiply that by tens of thousands of more employees. So that, you know, the shifting of personnel, uh, and, and again, you know, we were essential. So we can't, it's not like we could take a week off to shut down and figure all this out. It was all happening on the fly. So that was a big challenge. But, you know, I, I think kind of to some of our earlier points in the discussion, it turns out when all said and done, you can do it. Uh, and now it's, you know, it's kind of become ubiquitous in terms of, you know, working from home. It's it's really, you know, the, the, there's always kinks to work out and it can always be better. Um, but, you know, the answer is yes, you know, you can do it. Um, and you can kind of have these, you know, hybrid um, physical presences where you need to. Um, so, that's going to change things. I think that's one of the lasting effects, like Nicole was mentioning, you know, going down the pike. Um, and certainly for real estate professionals or businesses with real estate bents, um, you know, that's a that's a really um, uh, important talk that you have to have with yourself. What is tenancy going to look like right now? Because we're in the future, because if people don't need the office space the way that they used to, what does that do? Right. How does that change? How does that change that particular um, aspect of real estate in general? Um, so that, that brings up some interesting questions there. You know, other challenges too, um, kind of going back to what I said before, you know, some some folks don't really have the luxury of being able to transact completely online. So, you know, uh, how do you handle folks coming to the branch, you know, looking for actual cash, right? So uh, some of the policies and procedures, you know, that we've, um, that we've adjusted has been, like I was saying before, using the online app to del with more deliverables where possible. Um, you know, having special hours within our branches for high risk individuals. So, you know, for the first hour or so of our branches that are open still, um, it's it's geared specifically to, you know, folks uh, uh, in a high risk category is like uh, in the elderly space. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, those were some of the challenges that we have to, that we had to get in place. You know, the funny thing is, uh, you know, on, on our investment side in the investment world, luckily that was always kind of a digital kind of delivery anyway. So that didn't change much, but certainly, um, in the midst of a very, very volatile market, you know, how are you deploying content and how are you staying in front of your clients, you know, and how are you accepting things like, you know, trades and that sort of thing. So those were all, um, you know, and again, I think we've mitigated that now through these, some of these digital channels, but that's still evolving, right? And will continue to evolve. So, um, you know, I, I think every firm uh, handled it in their own way. It's, it's tough because a lot of this and Sue and I were talking about this before we started, you can only be so proactive, right? A lot of it's reactive. Um, but, you know, now that we've kind of find our, found ourselves in the scenario for a while or for an extended period of time, you can kind of assume, well, look, if we're going to do prudent planning, let's just assume this is the way it is for now. And how do we continue to shift as needed, right? 
um, or how do we continue to enhance? Because now, you know, I, I think things have slowed down to the point where, for us at least, um, we were really focused on getting back to business as usual. Um, after, you know, after the initial drop in treasury where, you know, everybody in the world was picking up the phone and calling to refinance. And then right on the heels of that, we had the PPP. So, you know, the, uh, you know, now I think a lot of folks hopefully are trying to get back to some degree of business as usual. It's just, you know, how do you continue to do that in this environment? So, so uh, we've got about six minutes left here and I don't see any questions in the chat yet. So I've got some questions for you folks, if that's okay, um, because I think, you know, again, what, what you guys are seeing is, is fascinating. And, um, you know, certainly, again, having trusted advisors like you uh, as part of my business team uh, would be essential for me to, again, kind of navigate these really murky and confusing waters. So, um, you know, I mentioned this a second ago, but uh, Nicole, if, um, tell me about your experience with the uh, with the PPP loans or, you know, maybe what you see coming down the pipe, because I think that affects a lot of the small business owners that may be listening to this today. Yeah, the PPP loan. So um, I've done a couple talks on PPP loans, and I, my best advice would be a um, couple things: just read the read the um, read the forgiveness application, because the forgiveness application is the guy is basically the framework on how you're going to get this uh, loan forgiven, right? And that's what you're looking at. And I would also say just keep really good records. You know, if you get audited, you just want to be able to show everything. And what I generally was advising people to do is to put the money in a separate account. Don't even, you know, don't even leave it in your main account, put it in a separate account. So it's just found money and then pay out, uh, you know, your, your employee expenses and, you know, your related expenses out of that account. The other piece of advice I can give you on the PPP is it is changing. They extended it to 26 weeks instead of the original eight weeks or, you know, 57 days. So be sure and take a look if you're not aware of those updates, because they did also change the 75-25 rule. I would take a look at that. And I would also be thoughtful of the fact that, um, if you have employees that do not want to come back, um, you can get punished under PPP and the way you would document that is report them to unemployment. And that's not always fun. It's not always fun to be the bad guy, but you need to make sure you have documentation that shows you offered people their jobs back and they refused. And just saying, oh, I said Susie could come back and she said she didn't want to come back and now she's on unemployment is not going to work. Um, you're going to have to make sure that you're documenting and that's just part of keeping good records. And that can be emails. That can be totally fine. It can be emails, but good record keeping is what's going to serve you well. And what I do is I literally put a file on my computer screen. And when I have documents that apply, I just stick them in that file. I have an email. I just stick it in that file. And that way, you know, it, listen, nobody wants to get audited. But if you do, it's, you know, if you know you complied and you know you kept good records, it's literally an hour long exercise. It's not fun, but it's just an hour. Uh, my husband and I, we get audited every year. It's not a big deal. You know why? Because all of our records are in order. I know everything's legitimate. We get our audit letter. I'm like, oh, they audited us on this this year. We get all the records together with our accountant and we send them off. Not a problem. And if you do that and you comply, but look at that forgiveness application because that is the framework they are looking at for that forgiveness. And that's what they, and you, and the forgiveness application even says, here are the documents we'll be asking for. So look for that. And those are the documents you should be keeping. It's all there. So that's what I would suggest. Great, thank you, Nicole. Uh, now, Sue, in your world, uh, again, we talked about this a little bit, but what do you see coming down the pike as potentially the single biggest challenge for employers? Um, and you, you touched on some great um, uh, legislation that people should be aware about. And Nicole, certainly, you know, please offer your two cents on that as well. Um, but you know, in, in, in this landscape, what is the main challenge that you think um, employers should be prepared for, um, as far as you know, uh, as far as what's coming or what could be coming? in terms of how they need to be engaging their employees or, you know, kind of shoring things up to get their arms around their employee base. Yeah, I have an uh, opposing counsel that I've had in about five separate wage and hour class actions. And I just the other day saw him on TV, uh, first time I'd seen him on TV, advertising that he's looking for COVID-19 cases and saying, were you wrongfully, unfairly terminated, laid, unfairly laid off because of COVID-19? So, you know, they're, they're out there mining for work. So, yeah, and um, as, I was, as tasteful as I found that, that does teach us a lesson that we really do need to make sure that we're doing it correctly. And doing it correctly means if somebody needs time off, that you need to go and make sure that you properly designate that time off under the applicable rules that are in place because there are overlapping rules that apply depending on your size and, and there's different laws, but that could be FMLA or CIFRA, the state counterpart, or the FFCRA, the new paid sick, the federal paid sick leave law, 
city of LA paid sick leave, state of California paid sick leave. It could be workers' comp. It could just be that they're disabled under the ADA and the state counterpart fee. So there's all these leave laws. So right now, that's always been a challenge, but right now even more so because people need time, and everybody's different. People need time off for different reasons. Sometimes it's because of themselves, or sometimes it's a family member, sometimes they're taking care of a child, sometimes, you know, all these circumstances are different. And if that is in, if that's added to the mix, that just further complicates what employers need to do. So I think that is this moment um, where we're concerned about making sure people are in compliance there. Um, and of course, in my world, every even if somebody was not unlawfully terminated, when they go talk to the lawyer, the lawyer it's always going to say, show me your pay stubs, show me your payroll records, will you pay directly? And that could trigger wage and hour claims because we're still, people are we're still seeing compliance problems there. So leave laws and wage and hour right now, those are the biggest areas that people really, I think it might be need to focus on. Thank you so much, Sue. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are at the end of our time now. Uh, we want to thank everybody for joining us. We hope it was of value to you. We hope there are some great takeaways here. Again, I think the biggest takeaway is make sure that you have professionals in your corner uh, to help you during these rocky times. Uh, make sure you've got a Nicole to help you with the with the government affairs side of things and um, you know interfacing with organizations like the SBA. Uh, make sure that you've got a Sue to help you deal with your, your employees uh, and making sure you're not stepping on any potential legal landmines because they're out there. Um, and I would say, you know, in, in the banking space, just make sure the question that I ask all potential clients right now, especially now more than ever, when you call your bank um, for some help or some advice, does somebody answer? And if they do, do they know you? Do they know your business? Um, if not, I think it's important that you have the conversation to say we should look for other avenues. But more more now than ever, please leverage your trusted advisors. And if you don't know where to get them, start with your local chamber of commerce. Sherman Oaks is a great area and you've got a lot of great professionals. So take advantage of what you've got. We want to thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sue. Thank you so much, Nicole. We appreciate you sharing your expertise. And please, you can get their information through the Chamber of Commerce website. Um, so don't be shy about reaching out if you've got follow-up questions after the fact. Thanks so much, everybody, for your time today. And uh, enjoy the rest of the event.